Chapter 12 Void Containment Zael gave Cedred his hardest stare. He sheathed his saber. Fine, Garrick. We'll play at your game. A smarmy smile crossed Rummy's lips. I'd hope he'd make the right choice. Now let's be on with it. His palm upturned, he curled his fingers expectedly. Zale reached into his coat. His hand brushed over the lump of the grimstone casing in his pocket. When his hand came back out, it was extended by a ghostly white glow. Cedred stared at the light, his expression mesmerized. Is that... Nope! Zale shouted. The light of Fulger's analase intensified in his grasp. He pointed it directly at the Grimkin commander standing by the wall behind Rummy. A blast of energy shot forth, a stream of pulsing white spheres. A few of the Grimkins, along with the commander, were sent sprawling, ricocheting off the cave wall with a shower of rocks. Zale was as shocked as anyone, but now was not the time to question his fortunes. At first, Rummy's jaw dropped in surprise, but soon his face twisted with rage, baring yellow teeth. He drew his sword. Damn ye to the depths, Murdoch! He turned to the flustered group of Grimkins. Come on, ye feathered scrubs! Attack! Zale's crew sprang into action, flinging away the ropes and netting they had managed to cut through. They descended the rocky ledge and rushed at the Grimkins, unarmed, their cries and shouts filling the cavern. Zale glimpsed Starlina toward the rear of the bunch, Jensen keeping close, and he felt very relieved to see her unharmed. Yancey and Rosh and a few others claimed the dark gray blades that had been dropped by Zale's victims. Wigglebelly slammed his girth into one of the enemies, crushing it against the wall. Hookney decked it in the beak before it could recover. Falger worked his way toward the edge of the melee, calling to Zale, The Novidian suits you, Captain! Here! Zale shouted back, tossing the dagger. Help the crew! Falger caught it by the grip. It practically floated to his hand and turned to engage the opposition. Zale looked down at Boomer and the small crossbow that he held. Boomer, you too! Go help! Yee yee! Rock -a -ta! He yelled, bounding off after Falger. Father! screamed Starlina. Look out! Zale turned just in time to see Seedred lash out with his sword. He stepped aside, drawing his saber and traded a few blows with his rival. Father, she says, Seedred said. I'm not sure which of the two of us wants more for honor, Zale. Me for turning the Grimkins on you, or you for bringing her own daughter to her death? That answer's very simple, Garrick. You're a slimy, traitorous ratbag. Well, we all have our qualities, don't we? <laughs> he swung out again, striking Zale's saber. Zale was heavy on his feet, but his arms were swift and precise. He parried up high, then low, trying to sneak in a stab to Cedred's arm. There was a time in their rivalry when Zale considered Cedred merely ruthless, but never a cold-blooded murderer. That time had passed, and now Zale himself wondered how close he might be pushed to taking a fellow countryman's life. Cedred tried all manner of dirty techniques. Jabs at the chest, <laughs> swipes toward the throat, all the while cackling through a throat that sounded ever parched with thirst. All his attempts were thwarted by Zale's counter-strikes. Meanwhile, Zale's crew continued to battle for position against the Grimkins. He chanced a glimpse and observed a general deadlock in the brawl. Zale managed to rip a seam of Cedred's coat near the shoulder. Me best coat, Zale, said Rummy. You'll be paying for that. Well, to be fair, Zale huffed between heavy breaths. You started it. Cedred hopped upon a rock where the ground sloped upward toward the ledge above the lake, gaining slightly higher ground. Zale determined he'd had enough of this. In the second Cedred spent steadying himself upon the rock, Zale grabbed a stone from the floor and launched it, hitting Rummy squarely in the head. He tumbled backward, landing hard upon the bed of loose rocks beside the lake. 
Zill wiped sweat from his brow and stared at Seadred's now motionless form slumped upon the rocks. Zill breathed a sigh of relief. Then he looked to the battle between the Grimkins, the prime of Seadred's mercenaries and his crew. Shaking out his shoulders, he readied himself for more action. Stalina, stay close, shouted Jensen from atop the ledge. A full, close combat brawl had erupted inside the cave. Free of their bindings, most of the crew had made it their priority to charge down from the ledge and into the mob of Grimkins. Jensen had made it his priority to keep Starlina unharmed. They were relieved to see Captain Murdoch prevail against Seadred, but it was short-lived. Jensen had no weapon, and the slope leading up to the ledge was total mayhem. Behind them, perhaps 15 feet below the ledge, was the subterranean lake. At the moment, about all he could do was watch and stay alert. Several of the Grimkins leaped forward, diving into crewmen's shoulders and pushing them to the ground. Numerous deckhands took a solid beating. Sal, Snow, Jonas, Bert, but did their best to fight back. Yvette and two of her oarsmen, Archie and Fritz, had managed to capture swords. Soon, Yancey, Casper, Kelvin, and Dippy had done the same, dueling and swinging as best they could manage in such a tight crowd. Fulger struck in blurs of light, aiming for the black amulets that the Grimkins wore around their necks. When his Novidian dagger hit its mark, the amulets exploded into dark purple clouds. At the edge of the fight, Captain Murdoch had just spun a Grimkin around by the shoulders and bopped it between the eyes. We've got to find a way down, said Starlina. Come on, we might be able to slip down the side here, Jensen said. It was steep and rocky, and it would take them straight over the now still lump of sea dread, but they could probably make it. He grabbed Starlina's hand and had taken the first step over the side when a Grimkin leaped out of nowhere and tackled him to the ground. It screeched angrily and punched his face and chest in rapid succession. Starlina shrieked and fell backwards. Jensen felt stunned, his jaw throbbing in pain. The Grimkin stood, lifted him by his shirt, and cuffed him again. Jensen finally gained enough clarity of mind to grapple the Grimkin by its arms and push it off, taking his own swing at its face. The Grimkin swung back, and Jensen dodged. It swung again, and Jensen pushed away its arm. They traded several jabs and kicks before grappling with each other and turning a dangerous circle near the ledge. Jensen landed a solid kick to its side and a right hook to its shoulder. The Grimkin gave Jensen's forehead a sharp peck with its beak. He stumbled back and fell to his rump in dizzying pain, his hands landing upon loose rocks. Starlina grabbed the Grimkin from behind, slapping and scratching at its face. It was terribly swift and shouldered her off with little effort. She did her best to strike back, but the Grimkin pushed through her hits, grabbed her by the arm, and yanked her over the ledge. Screaming, Starlina fell into the water below. Starlina! Jensen shouted. He sprang to his feet. The Grimkin turned to him with a screech, and Jensen swung two rocks together to crack its beak, turning its face into a bloody mess. Jensen dropped the rocks and decked it three more times. It wavered, and Jensen kicked it into the rocks over the steep side of the ledge. Wasting not another moment, he jumped from the ledge into the lake below. Zale finally caught up with his crew as the battle in the cave raged on. Dippy ran up to greet him just beyond the edge of the battle. Nicely played, Captain, said Dippy. And you, Zale said. Did someone have a knife stowed away? Jasper, sir. Ah, it'll be a great story to relay over a stein of ale aboard the Queenie. Zale nodded his approval. No doubt it will. Let's get these duck-brained fools off our backs and make for the ship. Captain, called Fulger, running to join Zale and Dippy. Praise be to Elo, you're okay. I am fine. We need to be on our way, Fulger. Can you and your dagger make quick work of these remaining Grimkins? I am trying my best, whilst not risking harm to the crew with anything too explosive. These remaining foes are particularly strong in the void. I aim for their burn, but I must strike with care. Should one of them happen to turn my powers against us, it could be devastating. Zale raised an eyebrow. 
They can do that? Powerful creepers. Those well-practiced in the void should never be underestimated. We'll never give them the chance, Dippy said. Zale took a moment to observe the battle. A grimkin fell near the base of the slope with a strangled squawk, Yancey roaring in triumph. Boomer was a pure menace to the enemies, hopping about between heads, weaving around legs and firing the occasional bolt from his miniature crossbow. Zale heard his animalistic cackle rise above the action and couldn't help but smile. Murdoch's mates were holding their own so far, and Zale was pleased with their number compared to the Grimkins. He was ready to join them, but first he needed this moment to debrief with Dippy and Fulger. McPherson's hiding place was interesting, Zale said, like a sliver of the Shadow Age. Sir, said Dippy, did you say the Shadow Age? That's right, Dippy. I can't tell you much from history, but that place felt very real and very disturbing. Fulger leaned in with interest. Were you successful in your search? That I was, Zale said. He pulled out the grimstone casing and showed it to Fulger. He glared at it as though Zale were holding a rotten apple. So much evil in so small a container, Fulger said. There are words on it. Dark opens dark. Zale pushed the casing back out of view. You know what it means? Fulger reared back his head and laughed. <laughs> that, Captain, is perhaps the easiest riddle of them all. He reached into his own pocket and pulled out an amulet containing a black, purple-veined stone. Burn. The dark ethereal. Zale took the amulet and stared at it, hardly believing that this could be the answer. Where did you get this? Zale asked. The Grimkins use it to conjure their powers of the void. I took this from one of them. I meant to destroy it, but, well, you never know when a thing might come in useful. And here we are. Fulger's words were almost like a cue, for at that moment, darkness exploded between the Grimkins and Murdoch's crew. Screams of pain and terror filled the cavern. Several men were heaved high into the air. No! Fulger shouted, dashing back toward the battle, glowing Annalise in hand. There were not many Grimkins remaining, but Zale realized that the gnarled-looking commander was among those still active. Several crewmen, including Rosh, writhed and howled upon the floor. I can't feel my arm, Rosh bellowed. Yancey hastily dragged him back. Regroup, shouted Dippy. Shield the injured! Murdoch's crew clustered together and positioned themselves to protect the wounded. Fulger quickly made rounds among them, offering comfort and remedy where he could. Zale, still slightly removed from the main action, glared at their remaining foes. He was surprised to see only five, the commander included, given how much havoc they'd still managed to cause. Grimkins of Acadia, Zale bellowed. You fought well and true to your charge. Enough of this. Your captain is down and you are outnumbered. It is senseless to continue this contest. Let us reach a truce from this point, and we'll depart unhindered with our wounded and fallen, each to their own ship so that we can leave this cursed and forsaken land behind. The Grimkin's dark eyes exchanged glances. What say you? Zale asked. The cursed is you, filth of Tuscany! The commander hissed. Standing in Gukan for us is honor most great. Our number is handily greater than yours, Zale said. The commanding Grimkin returned a sinister smile. For us is plenty. Before Zale could retort further, the commander squawked to its comrades. Its hard eyes fell upon Zale, challenging him, mocking him. Is plenty for void, screeched the Grimkin. Watch and see. 
The commander took burn in its hand and created a grayish, silver, barely translucent field that completely encased Murdoch's crew. Their shouts from within were heavily muffled by the barrier. You yoke-headed swines! Zale stepped toward them but soon stopped as the other four Grimkins pointed their swords and burn in his direction. Fulgur, he thought. Fulgur is in there with his Navidian. He hoped against hope that their spiritual guide would be strong enough to get them through this. Fulgur tightened his fingers around the Novidian Analace and stared at the dome now surrounding him and the Queenie's crew. What is this? Yes. What is this? Several of the men asked. They pushed and kicked and struck at the anomaly, but it would not give. They have surrounded us in an encasement of void energy, Fulgur said, trying his best to remain calm even as those around him became more frenzied. Boomer chittered and squealed like an oversized rodent freshly trapped. He kept throwing himself into the barrier, each attempt as futile as the last. Fulger reached down and cupped his shoulder. That will not help, my little friend. You can get us out of this, right? asked Casper. I have heard of this power, although I have never encountered it. So is that a maybe? asked Yancey. Fulger breathed out and breathed in, gauging his aura trying to suppress the pains and stress signals radiating throughout his body. He had nearly overdone it multiple times today. This was the risk of having honed his abilities to the extent that he had. There was an inherent risk to channeling large amounts of ethereal energy through a human's confined mortal shell. Too much magnetism could deplete his essential metals. Too much electrical exertion might disrupt the impulses controlling his heartbeats. Much could go amiss. It was ever a balance. He tried stabbing at the barrier. It would not puncture. He pressed his hands against it, feeling the vibrations of the energy. Whiteness surrounded his points of contact, but it was not enough to break through. Everyone watched him. I've had little chance to recuperate, he said, removing his hands. There must be some way out of this thing, said Yvette. Ah! Jackson, being the largest of them all, charged at the wall. No, don't! Fulger shouted. It was too late. Jackson ricocheted off the wall and fell like a giant lump of mashed potatoes. <laughs> Jackson stood with the help of two crewmates, his face indignant. That thing's tough, man. Really solid. Only an ethereal power can dissolve this, Fulger said. For a fielder, I admit it will require much strength. Is there anything we can do to help you? Dalbernon asked. Anything that can boost your ability? Fulger shook his head. Not unless an etheretical affinity has been awakened within any of you. To my knowledge, that is not... He stopped himself and peered through the faintly translucent wall where Captain Murdoch stood outside the barrier, shouting words they could not hear. Unless... perhaps... Suddenly the dome started to move. It slid slowly along the ground, moving away from the Grimkins. They're pushing us toward the lake! shouted Miles. Push against it! screamed Yvette. She threw her hands into the wall of the dome. Her oarsmen and several other crew members joined her. The dome was unhindered, its pace unchanged. It merely pushed the crew along, no matter how much they dug their boots into the ground. Fulger was not surprised. Phasing this sort of contrivance would require more than any amount of physical strength. He searched his inner strength, knowing it was not enough, but he had to try. He gripped the Novidian and slammed his hands into the dome. Brilliant white energy emanated from his touch. The dome's movement slowed a little, but it did not stop. It continued toward its target, pushing large rocks out of its path. He looked again to the man outside the dome. He knew it was Captain Murdoch. He pounded against the wall of energy as though banging on a door, causing bursts of white light to spread from each impact. Fulger could only hope his signal would be grasped from the other side, because it was the only hope he had left of gathering enough strength against their deadly prison. 
Zale saw the bursts of white light from inside the dome and knew it could only be Fulger. Feeling insanely helpless already, he was relieved to see the dome's movement slowed, if only a little, as Fulger took his powers to it. Still, something was amiss. The dome continued to move closer and closer to the lake. Fulger's movements seemed increasingly frantic, not so much the controlled actions Zale had come to associate with the man. Finally, it dawned on Zale. Fulger was trying to get his attention. I see you, Zale thought. What under the rings do you want me to do? Zale looked at the Grimkins. While the commander alone had initially created the anomaly, now all five of them were concentrated on keeping it intact. Keeping twenty-something men imprisoned in some hexed dome, Zale figured, must take a combined effort. He stepped slowly closer to the barrier. Aside from the pulses of white, Zale couldn't make out anything definitive within. He could only see dark forms frantically trying to push against the dome's movement. It was getting very close to the lake now. Soon its edge would touch the water. The horrific realization had already occurred to Zale that the Grimkins intended to drown his entire crew. After a bit longer, the white bursts became handprints. Fulger was pushing deliberately against the wall so that the shape of his hands shone through. Zale got the distinct impression that Fulger wanted him to touch the dome from the outside. With another furtive glance at the Grimkins, Zale took off and jogged toward Fulger's position. He was just reaching out for it when he suffered a hard hit from the side that took him down and knocked the wind from his lungs. His saber clashed to the cave floor several feet away, too far to reach. Zale, you bloated gaffer! Surely you didn't think our contest would come to an end as swift as that. Gasping, Zale sat up, staring into Seedred's blade. Now, Seedred said, let's see if you finally come to your senses. I'll be having that grimstone, if you please. <laughs>